on Jerusalem Dateline. This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Israel takes an unprecedented step toward anti-missile defense. And a joint Bahraini Emirati delegation makes an historic visit to Jerusalem during the celebration of Hanukkah. And twin threats, China and the global reset. And Israeli archaeologists uncover a rare find in the hills around Jerusalem. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Despite the global focus on COVID, Israel must still be on guard against the threat of missile and rocket attacks from outside its borders. As CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl reports, new technology is helping in the fight. This week, Israel and the U.S. celebrated an unprecedented and successful test of this multi-level anti-missile system. I am happy to be present in another successful test of our multi-layered air defense system, which protects the state of Israel against long-range and short-range missiles and threats from the north, from the east, and from every possible direction. Israel faces constant threat of Hamas and other terrorist rockets from the south and Hezbollah in the north. As many as 150,000 missiles are aimed at the Jewish state that could hit the entire country. The systems in this multi-layered mechanism provide Israel with a top-tier strategic capability, enabling us to operate effectively in every scenario. The U.S. supported systems known as Iron Dome, David's Sling, and the Arrow 2 and 3 contain four layers to deal with different threats. We're proud to be a part of the team, and, uh, and I can't tell you how excited I am uh, for uh, the country of Israel today. Just another uh, mark of success. During the test, the targets launched from the air and land, while the interceptors were loaded onto ships and launched from the Mediterranean. <laughs> An advanced version of David's sling targets threats representing cruise and ballistic missiles. A feature simulating future threats will enable experts to evaluate and upgrade the system's capabilities. Tests also demonstrated the often used and reliable Iron Dome, known for its ability to intercept rockets from Gaza. Key systems tested included detection, tracking, and interception, with the idea that if the first level missed its target, the next level would intercept the threat, and that the systems would be capable of intercepting threats simultaneously during conflict. The tests were hailed as a critical milestone in advancing Israel's operational capabilities in defending itself against current and future threats. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, the Abraham Accords continue to break new barriers, and one of the latest developments took place here in Jerusalem during Hanukkah, the Jewish Festival of Lights. In a scene once thought impossible, a delegation from Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates came to Jerusalem this week and helped light the Hanukkah candles at Jerusalem's Western Wall. It's my first time in Israel, and I believe it's a historic time to be in Israel. Uh, an amazing place, a great nation, and the most important thing is a lot of lovely people who want peace. Both countries recently normalized relations with Israel in what's become known as the Abraham Accords, brokered by the Trump administration. Israeli President Reuven Rivlin welcomed the delegation to his home. It's such a pleasure. It's a pleasure. When we are talking about peace, it's people to people. The delegation, which included business people, academics and bloggers, is part of the Sharaka Project, a unified effort from the three countries to grow relationships between young people in Israel and these Arab states. Sharaka is an Arabic word for cooperation. God bless all of you and welcome, welcome. Thank you. It's a new era and we're so happy for it. And, and let's look forward yes. that you will be the bridge yes. to bring a lot of understanding between all the people in the region. The Abraham Accords help unify the Arab states in Israel against their common enemy, Iran. They also challenge conventional wisdom that peace would only be possible after resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The next major development could be a visit by Israeli President Reuven Rivlin and Prime Minister Netanyahu to the UAE and Bahrain. Here in Israel, archaeologists excavating about 20 miles outside Jerusalem have uncovered hundreds of oil lamps and one of the largest oil lamp workshops ever found in Israel from 1,700 years ago. 
How do we know we're in a workshop? Because of the stone molds we found. The stone molds were used by the potter in order to make large amounts of lamps. He'd take the stone mold, stick in the lump of material, stick the two molds together, and like that he'd make lots of lamps. They also found terracotta figurines of animals, horse riders, and women. Two of the lamps bore images of the temple menorah, and others carried a fish, a symbol of early Christianity. Archaeologists say that proves that the local population was a mix of pagans, Christians, and Jews. Coming up, the growing threat of China and what it means for the world. Well, here's a story with a global impact, including here in the Middle East. China's Xi Jinping has been called a modern-day emperor. Since taking power eight years ago, Xi has massively overhauled China's military economy and political influence. And as George Thomas shows us, the Chinese leader is talking global dominance. Napoleon Bonaparte, the French military leader, said more than two centuries ago that China is a sleeping lion. Let her sleep, for when she wakes, she will shake the world. China's President Xi Jinping has emphatically declared that the lion has awakened. Reaching back to the language of his imperial ancestors, Xi announced during his first speech as president in 2012 that his nation would embark on the Great Rejuvenation Project. Tom Miller documents China's rise in the book China's Asian Dream, empire building along the new Silk Road. Miller says since taking the reins, President Xi has been on a trajectory of preparing China to be the world's dominant power. Under Xi Jinping, you know, China has been very, very deliberately um, trying to realize its kind of ambition to become the global superpower. It talks about its centenary goal. So the People's Republic of China was founded in, in 1949, and by 2049, China wants to be the global um, superpower. Chinese scholars say it's also part of the 67-year-old's deep belief that his country has a divine right to rule the world. The mandate of heaven is from China's imperial past, um, where Chinese emperors believed that they not only had the right, but they were compelled by heaven to rule the world. One way is by military force. As commander-in-chief of the world's largest fighting force, Xi has remade China's People's Liberation Army, or PLA, into a military rapidly closing the gap on U.S. firepower. Zach Cooper is a China scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and lecturer at Princeton University. If you look at what they've done in the last three decades, we've seen about double-digit growth in the defense expenditures for most of that time. The results could mean a significant threat to the United States, her allies, and the Asia-Pacific's balance of power. It is likely that China will seek to build a military that is equal to, or in some cases superior to, the U.S. military or the military of any other great power that China perceives as a potential threat. The Pentagon revealing for the first time that China now has the world's largest navy and plans to double its nuclear warhead arsenal in this decade, which includes ballistic missiles that can reach the United States. Gordon Chang warns that China is also adapting its military capabilities to kill Americans. Well, it is a great military threat to the USA because China is developing weapons that are specifically targeting um, American aircraft carriers and others. And while China continues to secure its borders and coastal waters, Xi is also projecting power far from home. The Pentagon reports citing Chinese plans to open U.S.-style military bases from Asia to Africa to South America. We're really seeing an expansion of China's military footprint in a way that uh, certainly wouldn't have been uh, expected maybe 10 years ago. And I think we're just going to see that accelerate. China is also relying on its economy and technological prowess. In 2013, President Xi launched China's Belt and Road Initiative, sometimes referred to as the New Silk Road. Stretching from East Asia to Europe to Africa, China is busy building roads, railways, airports, dams, power grids, ports, bridges, and the list goes on, all in an attempt to gain economic, political, and diplomatic partnerships around the world. 
you know, it's expanded from about 65 countries originally, all more or less neighbors of China's, to encompass most of the developing world. So there are now more than 140 countries around the world which um, are officially a part of this initiative. Then, two years later, in 2015, the government in Beijing launched Made in China 2025 with the aim of being a technological superpower. It launched initiatives in high-tech industries such as robotics, artificial intelligence, and next-generation technology and telecommunications. China is doing its best not only to, to, to buy up tech from other countries, and we've seen the US pushing back against that very hard um, in recent years, but also to kind of create that tech itself. Miller says unlike Chinggis Khan and his Mongol empire, she isn't trying to build an empire in the classic sense. Instead, he argues that China under Xi wants to become an economic, military and technological juggernaut that will surpass the United States and dominate the world for the foreseeable future. When I use the word empire, I'm talking more in terms of an economic and diplomatic empire. China's neighbors watch her rise with mixed feelings. In America, levels of anxiety about China are at historic highs. The Trump administration has put Xi's government on notice for its handling of the coronavirus pandemic, its poor human rights record, trade imbalance, and a host of other thorny issues. Still, as the author of a recent political article wrote, America and the world doesn't get to veto China's rise, only to reckon with it. The question is, what will that reckoning look like in the years to come as China continues to get stronger? George Thomas, CBN News. Up next, the global reset for your future. Is it a conspiracy theory or the global elite plan for your future? If the threat from China isn't enough, global elites would like to push reset, putting their plan into play for your future. Dale Hurd shows us what they have in mind. Here's a video of your future. If some people at the World Economic Forum get their way, they say you'll own nothing and be happy about it. Energy will be green, rationed, and expensive. And travel will be restricted. Even your diet will be controlled. And currency will be digital. This left-wing dystopian dream is called the Great Reset and you're supposed to be excited about it. The Great Reset has been labeled a conspiracy theory and even sounds like a conspiracy theory. But everything we know about it comes from the global elites themselves, who have been quite open about it. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is a well-documented movement among many of the world's most powerful people. Justin Haskins is a leading authority on the Great Reset. Fundamentally, this is a radical and complete transformation of everything that we do in our society. To control people's behaviors, to control businesses, and to move society in the direction that you want to move it, it will change the way businesses are evaluated, it'll coerce businesses to pursue left-wing causes. The Great Reset was unveiled at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland where many of the world's most powerful people go to offer solutions to the world's problems. And the World Economic Forum sees the coronavirus pandemic as a historic opportunity to change the way the world operates. Right now we're facing a crisis of international proportion. It's going to have long-term impact for us. Their solution is essentially global socialism. Think of the Green New Deal combined with the COVID-19 lockdown restrictions and throw in something called the Fourth Industrial Revolution, in which technology is supposed to radically change the way we live and work. Klaus Schwab is the founder of the World Economic Forum. What the Fourth Industrial Revolution will lead to is a fusion of our physical, our digital, and our biological identities. It has the support not only of world leaders, but of global corporations like MasterCard and BP, brought to you by people who think they know what's best for you. By giving, you know, the elites, the technocrats in society, the, the most educated people, the ability to manipulate society 
pull the levers in society and, and manage and manipulate society so that it's, in their minds, perfect. But a Trump re-election would blow a massive hole in the Great Reset. One week before the election, Italian Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano wrote an open letter to the president, warning him that the Great Reset is inhuman faceless tyranny that seeks to subdue all of humanity, and that President Trump and the United States are the wall against the deep state the final assault of the children of darkness. Over the past four years, Donald Trump has been the single greatest roadblock for people who are pushing this internationalist, globalist sort of agenda. The elites at Davos are now counting on a Biden victory for their great reset to go forward. The World Economic Forum and the Biden campaign even share the same slogan, build back better. To build back better. It's also a phrase you, you've heard being used by Justin Trudeau, by the Pope, by Prin the Prince of Wales, and by leaders around the world. English journalist and author James Dellingpole. You'd be amazed by how many world leaders are on board with this globalist plan, even people that claim to be conservative. This is worse than Nazism. This is worse than communism. This is worse than fascism. These guys are planning on taking over the whole world. We'll hear more about the Great Reset when the World Economic Forum meets again in January. And whether he's in the White House or not, Donald Trump is expected to be a force, which could remain a problem for the hopeful backers of the Great Reset. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Up next, reading the Bible in the land of the Bible and the book of Luke, and the story of Mary and Elizabeth. Here's the latest segment of our Reading the Bible in the Land of the Bible, where we finish the first chapter of Luke, including the remarkable story of Mary and Elizabeth. The Gospel according to Luke. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant, for behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. Now Elizabeth full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him by the name of his father Zacharias. His mother answered and said, No, he shall be called John. But they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So they made signs to his father what he would have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, saying, His name is John. So they all marveled. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue loosed and he spoke, praising God. Then fear came on all who dwelt around him, and all these sayings were discussed through all the hill country of Judea. And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts, saying, 
What kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. And he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, and you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the dayspring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. Well, next week we're planning a special program on Christmas and we'll read the Christmas story from the Gospel of Luke. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline. on Jerusalem Dateline.